We're here with um, Iris Hoisler at the Sophie Larosière project at the AGYU, the Art Gallery of York University, uh, September 2016. And I'm delighted to be able to have a chat with Iris about the project. And let me begin by asking you, who is Sophie Larosière in your view? If I wouldn't know that at the beginning of a project, I would never have done it. So the question that you ask is the question that I ask. There is a certain material evidence of what this person left behind, and that triggers an investigation into um, signs, like uh, with X-ray uh, methods uh, executed in Toronto by the Michelin Institute and in Paris by the Centre de Recherche et de Restauration du Musée de France, um, looking into underlayers of her paintings. So what I can say are the hardware is she was a French painter, completely unknown, born in 1867 and died in 1948. And she was in the first half of her life not trained as an artist. She came late to this um, kind of education. She went to the La Grande Chaumière, but she was drawn very early on into um, sketching and drawing and entertained um, a relationship with Madeleine Smith uh, from a very um, prominent uh, French family of uh, English ancestors. Um, so this, the Smith family is um, a reality that my fictitious figure, Sophie La Rosière, hinges onto. All right, so let me go backwards a tiny bit to ask you, because you brought up the word fictitious which I didn't oh mention really? earlier yeah. on. Yes, and that's great because, in fact, I didn't tell anyone watching this that Sophie was invented. Well, you know, <laughs> you proved to me that she is fictitious. Um, I, I create these figures in a way so hyper-realistic, and that's why we are here with, you know, surrounded by this uh, period stuff, that in the end, they get so much flesh on that the fiction retreats because the hyperrealistic nature makes them believable. But yes, she, is, she was born as a, as a thought, as a fictitious character. Right. And then you set her into, as you say, all these material objects that become the forensic reality for the investigations. Yeah. Right? And then the show itself, maybe you'll describe to us how the show uh, physically places itself within these gallery spaces to provide that forensic yeah. evidence, all right? And then how this show then connects to the subsequent two shows so that we get a broader picture of what we're after through these okay, material objects. Okay, what was objects. question number one? <laughs> um, you want to have a description of, of the fall of the shows. So of the whole, bro let's, let's say it's a project that has different exhibition venue. Okay. Can we say it like yeah, that? Sure. And then I would say it is a novel in three dimension. So you open the bookcase and it's written the Sophie La Brosier project and you open it up and you then enter these different realms. And at the AGYU here, um, the visitor will actually encounter a period room, her studio found in Nogent sur Marne, just outside of Paris, in the state of uh, 1918 when she had an apocalyptic emotional breakdown and was, what looks from the outside, destroying her artistic uh, production of the last 10 years. Wow. So there's a love story that is behind. There's also uh, the First World War that impacts uh, her and, and her lover. Um, so the, the visitor will encounter that, really literally walk into that studio that from the outside looks um, like studs and aluminium, and when you enter, you are in a different world. We will see that soon. Right. And then there are items that were retrieved from her house and from her studio in, 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 in France that will be in a, a layout of uh, eight vitrines. These are memorabilia, uh, souvenirs, uh, personal letters, photographs of her time period um, 
and of her family background, uh, braided hair, some life casts um, of um, female um, body parts. Lots of things that draw you into what she was she interested? Who was this person before she overpainted everything black? I want to come back to the blackness that you mentioned, but also just give a quick overview of the next two show venues right. that continue to tell a story about her life. So the f this here is basically the AGYU is the the romantic, the seductive. This is where you delve in, where you hopefully suspend your, um, your sus suspension of disbelief that hopefully will happen. And uh, in the Zoom where we are here, there will be a projection with walkthroughs, videos that go in, in a loop that give the atmosphere and, you know, the, the Nouchon, the park, the English garden, all that. Then at the second venue at Scrap Metal Gallery downtown Toronto that opens at the 21st of September, just one week later, there will be a completely different approach to her work, a more contemporary art approach, but also very um, forensic analytic. We will see x-rays of the main nine works that were found. These are, we talk about, uh, probably first I have to describe what it is. So the sh she went into painting and she went into a relationship that was highly passionate in a time of her life where she was barely educated in oil painting, but she, and she had not a lot of um, resources or material means. So what she did together with her love of Florence, they started dismantling the house and using the back of a tabletop or of uh, um, a closet, um, uh, shelf boards, uh, doors, lots of doors that they unhinged. Um, to paint, and the paintings are executed in three layers. We have a lead white, what is the old um, oil white that uh, with the component of lead can withstand x-rays, and that's where the forensic comes in then. Then there is a layer of oil iconography that is highly erotic um, and gives basically the story away. And what we encounter here, it's black. Black and caustic without just a little bit of texture, that Sophie La Rosière apparently executed in this emotional phase of tabula rasa, um, melting this beeswax uh, that was from her property and mixing it with ash and with coal and pigment and then just covering everything. That's the blackness. So, if you don't ask a question before <laughs> I try to go back to scrap metal, yes. we will have the X-ray investigation we will have um, an investigation through key people in France who are um, located in authoritative institutions like the Victor Hugo, uh, the director of the Victor Hugo Museum, Gérard Audinet, or the technical director of the Citeur et Math of the lab laboratory that's underneath the Louvre, um, and various other people who try to identify what is this oeuvre, D is there any relevance nowadays, how would you put it into art history? Would you even bother? Mm -hmm. um, so that's at Scrap Metal. And then there will also in the back be a kind of research room that is basically um, a studio situation. Okay. And the th third and final venue will be a gallery, a private gallery, yeah. that will display, I don't want to give it away, you tell us. Well, I don't know yet if we will if come to the state, but the, the, the ideal thing would be to restore these black paintings by removing carefully the, the encaustic layer. So this is now an ethical question that we face mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And the ethical question is, can you destroy one artifact to aim for another? Right. Who says what is more well has it's more value? It's a conservation question that's posed every single day yeah. in the studio. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. In, in every laboratory, right. in every, yeah. Where does memory lie, ultimately? Right. Yeah. right. Okay. So, uh, you said tabula rasa when you talked about the encaustic covering these works, but in fact, it's not a tabula rasa, is it? It's a cover-up, 
through encaustic, and encaustic, just to remind everyone, is a waxy layer that is cast, if you will, or thrown or uh, applied. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, to a surface, pa painted on, yeah. right, yeah. and 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 can do all sorts of different kinds of things, technique technique wise. But yeah. in this particular instance, it's a kind of cover up story, right? It's a kind of um, washing away through wax covering what the stories are beneath. Well, all my projects are about something that's beyond. Mm -hmm. So when I say a tableau rather, it's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the important thing is to get the gaze beyond, to, to penetrate the mirror, to, to don't believe the first analytic gaze, mm -hmm. but to, to dig deeper. So that, that comes, mm. we, we're brought right back to the AGYU because with all of this, these objects that we're looking at, the right. furniture, the vitrines, the archival documents, the uh, casts, the molds, the braids, and so on that you just described, all of this is that forensic material, that evidence of right. a life. And it begs us to search with the encaustic-laden material into what that was. It's a kind of a terrible tease to make us want to search more, to continue the search and continue to connect the stories one to the next, or all these various layerings so of stories. So where do you think comes seduc the seduction? Why do you think you want to know more, you want to go beyond? It's an excellent question. I think you're putting objects in a room for us um, and we're asking ourselves, what are these objects? Did they belong to someone? Do they have stories to tell in and of themselves? Are they connected to each other so that they tell a larger story about the life of a person? Because clearly these kinds of objects, which are mostly furniture, um, were functional for a person's life or people's lives. So life. that means basically we encounter this material evidence with each person's, each our own, knowledge and experience that is a cultural one of what normally these objects represent, like a Spanish wall, or as you say in North America, room divider, <laughs> is, <laughs> is used to, to basically undress behind, mm. What's behind it? and then appear in a nude state. So the act of undressing is hidden, right. nothing else. Right, beautiful. It's interesting. Yes, yeah? it is. What we hide. What we hide, a closet hides, right? Behind you we have a reverse, a closet that's turned I around. I think a closet time. is, a closet is in this, it, it's against the wall, so it's, it's hiding its, its front. But this is hiding something, but the closet is keeping something. It's keeping, but it's also hiding. I mean, it's not glass, it's not see-through. There's a desire to close it off you from public seen it view. You from the other side. That's true. It has no door. Oh. Because the door, the door yeah. was made into a painting, and it's one of ah, the main paintings ah, of Sophie La Rosière. Ah. But so she does not hide something in the closet. It's an object, but you can hinge the door back, and then the painting is, is hidden. Oh, there you are. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game with it, yeah. what to show and what not to show. And, uh, we have interviewed a psychologist uh, in uh, two psychologists in uh, in, in Paris, uh, Jan Pellissier and Dominique Delic, when I was there on my research tour with Catherine Sicot, who is my partner in crime for this whole project. She's she's French and she facilitated and and she collaborated deeply with that. He talks a lot about l'écran, about the um, the screen. The screen. Right that is, on the one hand, showing something, on the one hand, uh, disguising or hiding something. Right, beautiful, yes. And we could say this is a screen. In fact, sometimes I think this is called a screen in English, mm -hmm. which is interesting, be, right? Yeah. Like a room screen or yeah. a room divider, yeah. Um, but ultimately, that really is what your work is all about. Maybe we'll go back into some of your earlier works okay. where you wrap or you um, build units of compressed lives inside pieces that we know by the hinting that you have on the outside walls or surfaces of this object that inside there's a lot going on that we'll never see. Yeah, um, whew, where do you want me to start with that? <laughs> um, I mean, in other words, I, it's a kind of a time capsule. Right, yes, that's true. 
And it's imagined because, yes, it is fictitious, but it's so well researched that it could be true. And what are these people doing? They want to give life to something that cannot be told. Because if it would be told, it would hit social reputations and jeopardize them. Or in, like in Hinaim to Amber, the social status of um, a servant would have never allowed the action she undertook in this uh, gentry uh, mansion, you know. So the people that I create are kind of these underdogs. They are in a constrained situation, but their creativity, although it might be on a leash, is, is so strong that I f they, they, like water finds a way to, to run, they, they execute something. And then they, the consciousness kicks in and they learn that they cannot afford that in their, in their social um, community mm -hmm. or in, in, in their situation of economics or of age or whatever it is, gender, race. Um, and then they find a way to encapsulate, like to, to, to hide it that it looks unassuming, it looks buried, it looks um, uninteresting. And it takes often 100 years to uh, have contemporary people who delve then into an um, excavation, into a forensic, into an analysis, um, in order to bridge it to the psychology that's still valuable for you and me as contemporary living people. Speak to me a little bit about, and here we are looking at your memories as a person, as an artist, your thoughts about France, turn of the 19th century into the 20th century. Does that period ring for you especially clear? Does it have special implications? Do you have yeah. some attachment to that period? I mean, yeah, I mean, there is a symbolism. There's, there's, there's crazy lots of things happening, but I don't feel uh, good going into the art history. I'm more interested in that psychological factor that at that time, being a woman, trying to be an artist, it was the first time, I think in, in 1892, that uh, Jean-Jacques Henner allowed women in the studio as um, students, basically. We had then the Académie Julien, and we had uh, La Grande Chaumière, that was found in, I think, 1904 by two, two women of, I think, French uh, uh, background. Swiss background. So we have, um, we have a very exciting time that women, also in photography, happen parallel, dare to become artists. And there were, there were of course, um, um, you know, uh, people before and women before who did a camouflage as men and there were, you know, hidden, hidden histories, you know, all that. But that was an, an outcoming that Modus and Becker, for example, mm -hmm. Um, Paula Mordes and Becker was in Paris in 2004 um, and she was influenced then by the Fauves and so there was a lot happening and um, I am interested in, in France probably from my German background because I, um, I put my prejudgments and my longing, my sensual longing and um, um, assumptions I place it there. It's easier than deal with my own homeland. Uh -huh. And it leaves this realm, realm for, for dreaming and for a certain freedom in creating a character. Did you feel less freedom in your, when you talk about your homeland, do you want to say where you're from? Yeah, I come from Germany. When I did uh, the, the legacy of Joseph Wagenbach, mm -hmm. it was highly darkly loaded. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the Second World War, the main character was 16 when the Second World War ended. He was basically old enough to have witnessed things, too young enough to be really drafted in. He was exactly on the, on, on the verge of becoming uh, a, a man. And uh, that experience of the Second World War and the uh, atrocities would basically hold him hostage for the rest of his life. And then he created a pandemonium of sculptures and an art practice that dealt with it, but never came to, uh, to peace. While Sophie La Rosière has much more distance with my own generation and my own homeland, 
um, so it's uh, it's more playful, and right. it's also between two women. Right. You know, it's a uh, the freedom that I take in creating people of different gender in different constellation of affinity um, and yeah. from different religions and time yeah. frames right. is of course a, a treat. Right, and frees up your possibility to think through stories because yeah. stories is a central component in your work. And for the purposes of this course, in terms of the knowledge of or the understanding of what memory is in conjunction with place, the idea that uh, memories form within a certain location, or that a location gives certain memories life, if you will. Right. right. What we were talking about earlier, which yeah. isn't on tape, but um, yeah. which has to do with the idea that place can trigger memories. It comes loaded to trigger memories we take away from it, or we can impose memories on a certain place. Exactly. And in many ways, your work does both. I mean, you do both, actually. You create narratives, you create fictions, you create um, stories, layer stories, integrate stories, transmedially, uh, as well as in solo passages, right? Right. Moving through through time. So, so we have to, as witnesses, if you will, as analysis, uh, analysts, excuse me, thinking in, uh, yes, other ways, um, brings us to your work in order to tease out what is real and what is not. And we always have this innate desire, I think, to distinguish between what is real and not. I mean, how many movies have you gone to where you say to yourself, gee, I wonder if that was really a tr based on a true story? We're always wanting to tie it back to something real so that we can believe. I mean, this, this goes now into, you know, a question, what is reality and what is fiction? Right, right. I mean, I create fictions in a way, to a degree, that I start believing into them. Mm. And only that gives me the authority to tell the story as if it would be a true story right. um, and not to feel like a liar. But I'm very, very aware, of course, that uh, this is fabricated. However, my work asks the question, only survivors can still tell story. Mm. So what we say is true is what is told. It does not include the untold. So sometimes it's, um, I mean, there's an old saying, I think it's Picasso or whatever, that sometimes you need to have uh, lies to tell the truth. I mean, this, this quote is... Recycled in many ways. Yes, yes, many, yes, many yes, ways. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I probably um, buy into that in a way. Yeah. I use that as my practice too. Well, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. I'm going to... This is uh, just a start. You have to come back. <laughs> We're going to film all of this in different ways at different times. We're yeah. going to see the progress of the work as it's being constructed for the opening on September 14th. By the time this is uploaded, students will have either had a chance to come visit it or the show will already be finished and they'll be watching the show, this. Both shows, uh, Scrub Metal and um, York, go until December 11th. Okay, so we have time for them so. to visit it, but, but even not into the next term, let's say. It doesn't really matter because the stories continue, right? And they'll witness it from yet another perspective through, through video, if you will, on. Well, I mean, the whole thing is, 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 a, is a choreography. So I, I can't just say you see it in, in this place and in this place. It's how people, some people might experience first the forensic part downtown and then come right. up to here. Oh, I see. And it might right. work the other way around. Right. Um, and then there's there's a website too about the project, right? So which extends the work and over allows time. research and you know watching right. the videos and stuff. So. Right, right. Anyway, thank you, uh, Iris Heusler, for this fabulous. <laughs> I don't want to call it interview conversation, informal way of thinking about your work and the connection that it has to ideas about memory and place. Well, thank you, Sharon. <laughs>